Good morning. How are you doing? Nice to see you all. You survived the week of heat. We only got another two months of it, so get used to it. Now, as many of you know, uh, about a year ago, my wife Maggie and I had the opportunity to buy our very first house in San Diego. It was an exciting time. It was, thank you, yes, it, it was a big victory. Uh, it was a, a product of God's blessing and provision. It was support from family. Uh, God used all sorts of things to make that possible. And what was amazing about it was that the house that we were living in was church housing at our last church, which meant that when I came over to Legacy, our housing ended as well. And that, that can be a little disconcerting. Uh, but as we got closer to the date, we were praying that God would provide. And sure enough, about a month before we were done at that church, uh, there was an older couple who said, hey, we're moving into a retirement facility. We're looking to sell our house. Are you interested in buying a house? And, and we said, it's funny you say that because, yes, we are interested in buying a house. And it turned out to be the right house in the right location, and God provided. But out of all the exciting things that came from buying that house, I think the thing that was most exciting was the fact that for the very first time since our son Odyssey was born, we would have a yard for our kids to play in together. That, that's a big deal, to have a space where your kids can play unsupervised in a, in a safe space. At our last house, they, they had a, a fenced-in driveway and then a fenced-in backyard that had cement on the ground and lots of power tools and, uh, and rusted metal. So it was the perfect place you want to put your little toddler out there to play. In other words, they haven't had a place to play together at home since our son was born. So, so we have this little backyard at our house. It's not huge. If your real estate agent was showing you our house, they would call it cozy, right? And it is cozy in the truest sense of the word. It, it's really a beautiful space. In the back of our yard, in the middle towards the back fence, we have this big shade tree that covers about 30% of the yard. And under that tree, uh, one of the first things that I did was to put up a hammock so that I could lay in the shade of that tree. And so when it's not 104 degrees outside, I lay out there in the shade and I feel the sun rays coming through it. And it's just a place of peace. To the left of that tree is this, this lush green lemon tree that when the conditions are right, it produces uh, like a thousand lemons the size of grapefruits that are bright yellow, which is just the, the perfect splash of color against the green backdrop of our yard. And then on the other corner of the yard, and I'm making the yard sound big right now, but there's like 10 feet in between each of these things, is this swing set that we built for our kids that they can go out and swing on and play on at, at any time. And, and so this yard is just a paradise. And one of the best things about this yard is that behind our fence is this ravine that goes down a hill, which means not only do we have just a little bit of a view, there's some trees kind of impeding the view, but, but the most important thing is that our backyard is quiet, right? And so when you go out into the backyard, the only thing that you really hear are the chirping of birds and the sound of our wind chime kind of blowing in the breeze. And when the conditions are right, I can lay in my hammock and this, this cool breeze blows up from out of the canyon over the hill and blows over me while I'm laying in the hammock and it makes the chimes ring. And my backyard is just paradise. I absolutely love it. And my kids love it too. Just in the last like three to four months, my kids have started making it their paradise as well. See, when we first moved in there, they insisted we come out to play with them. They didn't really play in the backyard much by themselves, and so they would want us to come out and play games with them, and that's a great thing, right? We love playing games with them, but, but sometimes we get home from work at six or seven at night, and we just wanna lay on the couch, and so we, we want them to be able to play by themselves too, but at first they weren't doing that, but just in the last three or four months, they've started to finally go into the yard themselves. And so one of my new favorite hobbies is to sit by the window that faces our backyard, and watch as they play together in the backyard of our very own home. It's, it's just a sweet season of life. And what's fun is to watch them create these games and these stories and play together over and over again for hours at a time. They'll create these stories and then enter into the stories and become these different people. And my daughter is at the perfect age to do this. She's constantly creating stories. She just turned seven years old. 
And so every day it's a new story. You know, during the Olympics, she wanted to be Simone Biles. And so she would go out in the backyard and she would do cartwheels and then she would make our son be the judge, right? And, <laughs> and as a two-year-old, he's a terrible judge. His scoring was all over the place. There was no consistency. He shouldn't be an Olympic judge, but, but he sits there and he does his best. And then when school started, she wants to be the teacher. And so now he has to be the student. And in, in typical seven-year-old girl fashion, she is bossing him around constantly. No, you do this, go over here and do this. She likes being in charge. But I love seeing them create stories and live into the stories that they create. Now, somewhere along the line, we're given the impression that this type of make-believe, this type of storytelling is for kids. Somewhere along the line, some mean, rude adult came into our lives and said, hey, get your head out of the clouds, right? Uh, get serious. It's, life is about responsibilities. You're 13 now or you're 15 now. It's time for you to get a job. And we start to believe that to be an adult is to stop telling stories. It's to get serious about life. That, that reality is where we have our feet firmly planted on the ground. And so we stop imagining. We, we stop creating. We start to get real. Or so we think. You remember a couple weeks ago, I talked about my teddy bear, right? I'm sure you guys have thought about it since. Um, but I, I explained how it's cute that my son Odyssey walks around dragging his chickie behind him. But it wouldn't be as cute if you came into my office for counseling and I came in carrying my teddy bear, right? The expectation is that we give those things up at some point. When in reality, all we really do is exchange those for more adult little uh, items of comfort, right? The keys to our BMW, the, the keys to our big house, whatever it is that, that gives us comfort, we carry those things around instead. And the same is true of storytelling. We, we give up storytelling like a child, but we never actually stop being storytellers. In fact, what we discover is that storytelling is foundational to the human experience. Storytelling is the lens through which we interpret the world and find our place within it. We are storytellers by nature. In his book, The Storytelling Animal, Jonathan Gottschall writes this, we are, as a species, addicted to story. Even when the body goes to sleep, the mind stays up all night telling itself stories. We live in stories all day long and use them as a tool to navigate and make sense of the world around us. They help us understand who we are and where we come from, shaping our personal and cultural identities. I mean, think about how many elements of our daily lives reflect this, this uh, storytelling nature. When we enter into a new season, we call it uh, turning a new chapter. When we leave something behind, we call it turning a new page, right? When we're willing to share our story, we call ourselves an open book. We even tend to think of our stories in terms of books. When we reach middle age, if we feel like it's time to, to reach a climax in our lives and we haven't reached a point where we've done something significant, what do we experience? We experience a midlife crisis. Why? Because we get to a point in our stories where we feel like a climax should be occurring. We should be accomplishing something. We should have reached the zenith of our story and yet nothing seems to be happening. And so we have midlife crises. And what do we do in our midlife crisis? We try to create a climax. We try to instigate something so that something of meaning can happen in our lives, not for any other reason than to stay on track with the story that we're creating in our own minds. And so when we get to that moment when we expect a climax, if it doesn't happen, we begin to feel anxious, we begin to feel insecure because it feels like we're too far along in our story for nothing meaningful to have happened, or so we think. In moments of reflection, when major life events occur or, or major birthdays happen, we even begin to reflect on our role in our lives and in the genre of our stories. We, we wonder if we're having trouble in our relationships, if we are living in a drama. Or maybe we're living in a comedy or, or a romance. And if we've faced enough hardship, we might even begin to think that our story is more like a Greek tragedy, right? We begin to think that we're doomed to live lives of failure and, and heartache and heartbreak. 
And although we might not think in conscious terms like this, we ask these questions all the time. What defines our stories? And what's interesting is that the answers to these questions actually impact our lives in significant ways. They impact what we expect from life. They impact what we think we deserve from life. For example, if we live in a Greek tragedy, then we don't expect to have successful relationships or secure careers. Have you ever known someone like that where, where there's trouble around every corner? When, it, when something bad happens in their lives, they say, well, of course that would happen to me, right? Those kinds of things always happen to me. Why? Because they've become convinced that the genre of their story is a Greek tragedy. Or if you believe that you're living in a drama, then when you face challenges in relationships and, and you have you know, partner after partner, boyfriend after boyfriend, girlfriend after girlfriend, you think, well, that's just how I am. I'm, I'm a dramatic person. I, I deal with turnover in relationships. There's constantly something to argue about. The answers to these questions impact not only what we think we deserve in life, but what we expect. Why? Because we are storytellers by nature. Stories are the lens through which we interpret our lives and the lives around us. Not only do stories impact how we see ourselves, though, they impact how we see each other. They impact how we see ourselves as a culture. Think about all the, the fables and the myths and the fairy tales and the history books and biographies and autobiographies. Stories of people who have gone before us that shape our cultural and social identity. Think about the things that we think make us American. I think about growing up here in San Diego. In our elementary school, we used to say the Pledge of Allegiance every day. We used to have assemblies where we would sing American songs, America the Beautiful, and, the, and those types of songs. Those cultural stories shape what it means to be an American. I can remember going on a hike years ago out into the desert of Arizona to a cave where there were cave drawings that were over a thousand years old. And these cave drawings told the stories of, of great hunts and great battles and relationships. They told stories that had been passed on from generation to generation, defining what it meant to be a part of this Native, Native American tribe. And a thousand years later, those stories are still being told. We are storytellers by nature. You know, we have the same type of stories in our own lives. I can think of countless dinners growing up at my family's house, whether it was with my grandparents or my aunts and uncles, hearing stories about things like World War II, Korea, Vietnam, stories of immigration where our ancestors immigrated from their homeland to America, stories that shaped what it meant to be a part of my family, our values, our purpose. We are storytellers by nature. We're the only species on the earth that not only tell stories, but creates stories, that tells fictional stories, stories where we imagine that we're someone else. And philosophers say that we do this to help us understand ourselves, to give us strength and courage when we need it, to give us a sense of purpose and meaning. Stories are the primary way that we interpret the world and our place within it. Which is probably why Jesus always seemed to tell stories when he taught. Did you ever notice that Jesus never really preached like preachers do today, right? There's only like one time that I can think of in, in the entire Gospels where Jesus says, turn to this passage, right? Jesus doesn't say, turn to Zechariah chapter 9, or today we're going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 12, or, or let's do a word study on this word. He didn't do that, right? When Jesus taught, he talked about farmers and fields, right? He talked about fishermen and feasts. Jesus talked about things that they found in their daily life, and then he told stories about those things to communicate profound truths about the kingdom of God. Jesus understood the importance of being a good storyteller. And so he used those stories to help people understand their place in God's kingdom. Which is why I'm totally convinced that if we want to really understand our purpose on this earth and our place in God's kingdom, we have to understand not only our story, but our neighbor's stories and then how those stories work together within God's wider story of redemption for his people. And so I'm excited to announce this morning that we are beginning today a brand new sermon series that I'm calling Stories. And for the next nine months, we are going to work our way through this series, looking at over 35 different people in Scripture, learning about their stories, 
applying their stories and figuring out how our story is reflected in their story, how their stories are reflected in our stories, and how all of them make up the great story of God's redemption for his people. Are you excited? This is going to be good. I am totally excited. The longest series I've ever done in my career is eight weeks. So this is going to be a new thing for me. Uh, we're just going to dive right in. It's going to be awesome. And, and from Genesis to Revelation, we're going to get, look at the stories of God's people. And my hope is that through this series, you'll come to realize that the people we read about in Scripture are just like you. They have brokenness. They have pain. They have shame. And God uses it all to accomplish his purposes. And so we're going to look at three things this morning that I hope that you pull from this series. Three things that I hope that you get and apply to your life as we look at the broader story of God's people. And the first is this. I hope that you come to embrace your story. You come to embrace your own story. The subtitle of this series is My Story, Your Story, His Story. And the focus is looking at our stories how they relate to our neighbor's stories and then how they fit into God's larger story. So the first thing is that you learn to embrace your story, the good, the bad, and everything in between. But we have this natural tendency to want to edit our stories, don't we? We have this natural tendency to want to kind of highlight the good parts and minimize the bad parts, to focus on the things that make us look like we have our lives together, like we're doing everything right, like our kids are perfect. We have this tendency to want to edit our stories to make ourselves look better. And sometimes that's for vanity's sake. Sometimes that's because we want to, to make ourselves look better than we actually feel. But oftentimes it's really out of self-preservation, right? Oftentimes it's because we've experienced something in our lives, some sort of pain or suffering or shame or guilt that's simply too painful to revisit. Maybe you've experienced uh, abuse in your home as a child growing up. Or maybe you struggled in school and you felt like you were less intelligent or less capable than your friends and you felt deep shame for that. Maybe your family didn't have money and your, your best friend's family did. Maybe you've experienced sexual abuse from a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you're carrying deep shame from that. Or maybe you're dealing with an addiction that's out of control. Whatever your baggage is, you, you think about the idea of embracing that, and it's just too painful for you to bear. And so you'd rather minimize it, you'd rather forget about it, than to face it. And if that's you, I, I want you to know, first of all, that you're not alone. That every single person in this room is carrying baggage from the wounds that they've experienced and the mistakes that they've made. So number one, you're not alone. Nobody wants to face the baggage that they faced. But secondly, I want you to know this, that you will never become the best version of yourself if you're unwilling to confront the pain and shame that you've collected throughout your life. That the things that you've gone through, the pain that you've experienced, the suffering, the guilt, the shame, the judgment, all of those things can be used by God to make you into a stronger, healthier follower of Jesus. You know, for most of my life, I, I saw my pain and shame as something to minimize, especially as a pastor. It's easy to want to tuck those things away and not confront them because you're afraid it makes you look bad or weak or, or sinful or uh, unworthy of being on stage. But then I read a, an important book by a Christian author named Henry Nouwen. He's a famous Christian author of the 20th century, and he wrote a book called The Wounded Healer. The Wounded Healer. Write it down. Look it up later. Uh, the Wounded Healer uh, is basically a book whose premise is this, that we only become effective healers of our neighbors, effective caretakers, shepherds of our neighbors, when we embrace our own woundedness. That it's our wounds that actually prepare us to care for other people. Henry Nouwen writes this in his book, Nobody escapes being wounded. We are all wounded people. Whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually, the main question is not how can we hide our wounds so we don't have to be embarrassed, but how can we put our woundedness in the service of others? And so I want to encourage you through this series, and we're going to say this over and over and over again, for the next nine months to embrace your story. Don't be afraid to take the hard parts of your life and embrace them because the hard parts are just as much a part of you as the good parts. The painful parts are just a, a part, as much a part of shaping who you are as the victories in your life. 
I mean, think about it in your own life. If you've experienced abuse in a, in a relationship at home, how much more equipped are you to care for someone going through that situation than someone who's never experienced that before? If you've gone through a miscarriage and it just devastated your life, how much more are, equipped are you to care for someone who's gone through a miscarriage than someone like me who's never experienced that, right? Those painful points in our life actually become sources of great strength and healing as God wants to use you. And I think what you're going to find is that as you embrace your past, good, bad, and everything in between, that those are often the exact areas that God wants to use you to help heal the world around you. Suddenly you're going to find yourself after a miscarriage running into other women who have gone through that, who are going through that. And you're going to realize, I can speak into this person's life now. Jesus has something to say about this moment. He keeps putting these people in my path. God wants to use every bit of you to accomplish his purposes. Listen to how Paul talks about weakness in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In other words... When we try to depend on our own strength and courage to accomplish things in the world, when we depend on our own strength to move forward and make something of ourselves, what we discover is we're not strong enough to do it alone. That our true power lies in our ability to connect with the source of power. That when we depend on God, He strengthens us and He makes it possible to become the people that we're created to be. He says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so then Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, James writes this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. In other words, if we want to fulfill our call, if we want to become the best possible versions of ourselves, we have to embrace our weaknesses. We have to embrace our brokenness. We have to accept that we're not perfect, and that's okay. And so I hope through this series that you'll come to embrace your story. The second thing that I hope that you'll get from this series is learning to engage with your neighbor's story. You have to keep in mind that if you consider yourself a Christ follower, the expectation is that you'll be a Christian in motion, right? A Christian on mission, that we have a purpose that God has for our lives. That we have a calling to engage with our neighbor's stories and speak into their lives. Every single one of us, you don't have to be a pastor, you don't have to be on stage, Every single person that calls themselves a Christ follower has a mission that they're called to fulfill in their life. We have to remember that we're surrounded by people who are dying. We are surrounded by people who are drowning in their sin and they need someone to throw them a lifeline. And what we see is that God uses you and I to be that person. You know, it's so easy in our lives to just kind of go through life without knowing anybody, isn't it? It's so easy to, to go through lives, our lives without ever actually engaging with anyone. We say hi to the person at the grocery store, we chat with the bank teller, and then we go home and we mind our own business. And so one of the questions I've wrestled with this week, and I want to pose this morning, is the question of, do you know your neighbors? Do you know your neighbor's stories, right? Do they have siblings? Are their parents still alive? What do they do for a living? Are they from San Diego? Did they move from somewhere else? Are they married? When did they get married? What is their story? Do you know your neighbor's story or do you just wave to them from the driveway and then walk into your house? Do you engage with their stories and get to know them for who they are? You know, we can't expect people to respond to conversations about faith if we haven't taken time to hear their stories. You know, so often I, I see people trying to share their faith with their neighbor without giving them the respect to hear their story first. 
where they've come from, what they've been through. Did they grow up in the church? Did they not grow up in the church? If they grew up in the church and they're not in the church anymore, why? What did they experience? What did they go through? What's their story? You know, Jesus was great at getting up in people's business, wasn't he? Jesus loved to get involved in people's stories. Jesus almost never encountered someone whose story he wasn't interested in getting to know. I think of the, the Samaritan woman at the well. Do you remember that story? He comes to this woman. He starts having a conversation with her. It's going great. They're having a lot of fun. And then he says, go get your husband and come back and we'll keep this conversation going. And she goes, I'm not married. And he said, you're right to say that you're not married. In fact, you've been married five times and the man that you're living with now is not your husband. Jesus knew her story, right? Jesus had engaged with her. He had heard what she was going through. He knew what was happening in her life. And because of that, he had earned the right to speak into her lives. I once had a friend tell me that, that nobody's going to let you speak into their life until you've earned the right to be heard. And that really impacted me. I realized that I had been doing ministry in a way where I was trying to speak into the people's lives without having actually earned the right to be heard. And because of that, most of what I said just kind of went right over their heads. They thought, who are you to speak into my life? Who do you think you are? And I'm here to tell you that if you want to speak into your neighbor's life, you have to earn the right to be heard. And one of the ways that you earn that is by being willing to hear their story. So do you invite friends over to your house for dinner? Do you take them out to coffee? Do you meet them for lunch? Do you make room to hear their story? And do you do so in a way that's not proselytizing, but is actually interested in knowing them for who they are in that moment? Hearing their story and engaging with their stories in a way that honors them. You know, some of you might be sitting there thinking right now, all of my neighbors, all of my friends are in church with me right now, right? Like all, all of my friends are people that are sitting next to me right now. I go out to lunch with them after church. I meet them for my small group on a Wednesday night. I, this and that. That's a great thing, you guys. I, I think it's good and right for our primary group of friends to be found in the church. I think that's a good thing. But I'm also here to tell you that if you don't have any non-Christian friends, that you are missing your calling. That if you have filled your life with people who look like you and think like you and talk like you and believe like you, and you have no room left for non-believers, then you are missing your calling. You have a purpose, and that's to engage with the world, connect them to the church, and grow them into mature reproducing disciples. That's not a call of a pastor. That's a call of a Christ follower. One of the most um, clear and significant signs of a dying church is a congregation whose entire friend group is sitting next to them. I've been a part of churches like that where, where you host an event, you say, invite your friends, and nobody shows up. Why? Because all of their friends are in church. We have to be intentional about building relationships with non-Christians, you guys. It's our calling. It's, it's not, a, not a question. It's, it's not a suggestion. It is a command. And Jesus wants us to be engaging with the world so that they can experience a relationship with him. I mean, think about how different our church would look if for the next nine months we committed to finding one non-Christian friend a month. So I'm going to meet someone. I'm going to take them out to coffee. I'm going to get to know them and I'm going to experience life with them. And by the end of nine months, I'm going to have at least nine people that I know that don't know Jesus. Imagine how the church would change if we were intentional about building relationships with people who didn't know Jesus in order to hear their stories and see them redeemed. Listen to how Paul talks about this issue in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, Though I'm free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many people as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. By the way, Paul is 
is famous for writing complicated run-on sentences. I don't even want to tell you what the Greek looks like in this sentence. It's, an, it's a mess. But he says, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I've become all things to all people so that, are you ready? So that by all possible means, I might save some. I do this all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do we think about our relationships with non-Christians like that? Do we think about our Christian calling like that? That by all possible means, whatever it takes, I'm going to be in the world, I'm going to be walking through the world, I'm going to be building relationships with people in my world in order to see people say, this isn't Paul's calling, this isn't a pastor's calling, this is a Christ follower's calling. Can you imagine if Paul had only decided to hang out with other disciples? Right? Like the, the Greeks and the Romans, like, come on, those people eat pork, they're weird, they do all sorts of crazy things. I'm going to hang out with the disciples because they know what I'm going through. Because they believe what I believe. They share the same faith as me. Let's just hang out in Jerusalem and take care of each other. Can you imagine? We would not be here today. The church understood that if we're going to accomplish what God has in the world, we have to be intentional about engaging with our neighbor's stories. The third thing that I hope you get from this nine-month series is a desire to enter into God's story. You know, too often when we read the Bibles or we think about our Bibles, we, um, we, we assume that the story kind of ends there. Like you get to the last page of your Bible and it says the end and you kind of go, all right, God's done, right? The story's complete. All we have to do is wait till Jesus comes back. And yet when we read our scriptures, we find the exact opposite. When we read our Bibles over and over and over and over again, we see that the story is not complete. That, it, that it's like the last chapter of the book was torn out and that we're living in the last chapter right now. You know, after Jesus' resurrection, before he ascends to heaven, he gives his disciples what we call the Great Commission, right? which is to go into the world and make disciples. And the idea is that, that the last thing that Jesus says to his disciples before he leaves is that the story is not over. Right? That the story is continuing. In your lives, in my lives, the story continues. You know, what's interesting is that all four Gospels, four stories of Jesus' life in the Bible, all end differently. Which is kind of strange when you think about it, because Jesus has been resurrected. Wouldn't that be the end of the story? Right? Like, all right, he came back to life. He is who he says he is. The end. But we don't see that. All four Gospels end differently. In the book of Matthew... The story ends with Jesus and his disciples on top of the mountain and Jesus ascending to heaven. In the book of Mark, the story ends with the women leaving the empty tomb in amazement. That's it. We don't know what happens next. They just leave in amazement and that's the end of the story. At the end of Luke, in Luke chapter 24, the story ends with the disciples realizing Jesus has been resurrected and going back to Jerusalem, singing for joy and going to the temple. In other words, they saw this amazing thing happen and they said, I'll see you at church on Saturday, right? And then the Gospel of John ends with Peter's reinstatement. Peter, who denied Jesus, has been restored to his fellowship. All four Gospels end differently. And yet, in the midst of their differences, they have one thing in common, and that's this. That every single one of them wants you to know that the story is not over. Not, not a single one of them says... And God did all he was supposed to do. The story is done and complete. The end. Every single gospel writer wants you to know that you are an extension of God's story. That if the Bible were still being written today, that we would be included in it. That if the Bible is still being written today, there would be chapters on your life and what God is doing in your life. That the story of God's people is continuing today to do the work of Jesus until he returns. And my hope and prayer through this series is that you will leave this series feeling a strong sense that you are a part of God's continuing story, that you matter as much as the people in the Bible. In fact, I'm convinced that if you took some of these people we admire in Scripture, some of these important biblical figures, and you put them in our time today, 
that there are people in this room that would be more effective and have a larger impact on the kingdom of God than they would. I think they were good for their time. I think they had a purpose for their moment. But I'm here to tell you that this is our moment, that this is our purpose, that God wants to use us to accomplish his work. And if we don't step up and do it, nobody will. There's no David, there's no Moses, there's no Abraham, there's Thomas, there's Jonathan, there's David. We're all here for our purpose in our time to tell our story as a part of God's larger story of redemption. Amen? Amen. And every single one of us is absolutely essential to that story. There's not a single one of you. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what you have in your story that doesn't have a part to play in God's larger story of redemption. And I'm here to tell you, we want to hear your story and we want to see you live out your story in light of Jesus. Amen? Band's going to come forward now. And as they do, let me say this. Your story matters. Your story is valuable. Your story is important. No matter what you've been through, no matter what mistakes you've made, no matter what wounds you carry, your story matters. And at Legacy Church, we want you to know that you have a place here. I've said this over and over again, and I'll say it till the day I die, that if you want it, you have a seat at the table with Jesus when you come here. And my prayer is that over the next nine months, that you will come to see that every bit of who you are has a place in the story of God. That God wants to do great things through you if you'll just let him do it. That there are more chapters to be written and more storylines to be developed. In order to help you get the most out of this series, uh, we have bought you all composition books. So if you look at the end of your row, you can go ahead and pick those up and hand those down. And, and our hope is that you take those composition books and over the next nine months, you bring them to church with you. That you take notes during the sermons. That as we talk about these 35 different biblical characters that you write about their stories. You can use it as a journal. Write down your thoughts. Tell your story. And hopefully by the end of this series, you'll come to realize that the genre of your story isn't a drama. It isn't a comedy and, and it isn't a Greek tragedy that the genre of your story is adventure. And that from the moment you were born, God was taking you on this great adventure, redeeming and restoring you and recalling you back home to him. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, uh, we want to be a part of your adventure. We want to be a part of your story. And we pray, Lord, that you would sweep us up into your grand narrative, that you would give us a place to find home. Lord, draw us into your unfailing love. Redeem our stories and make them a story of victory, a story of hope, Lord, a story of redemption. In Christ's name we pray, amen.